Hi, I am Kalakanta Das, and ISKCON has saved my life. So I want to tell you a little about my experiences with ISKCON, especially uh, how I became involved and then what happened after Srila Prabhupada's departure. Uh, so first, let me offer my obeisances to Srila Prabhupada, all the assembled devotees, Hare Krishna, thank you for watching. I was a middle-class kid from New Mexico in the early 70s and seeking. So after high school, went out on a quest to find God, hitchhiked across part of the country and met devotees in Portland, Oregon. I immediately asked if I could move in. Dina Bandhu, the temple president, allowed that. And so I began my brahmachari life in 1972. Uh, I got to see Srila Prabhupada about 50 times before he passed away. And that uh, those experiences are very dear to me. I remember them clearly and uh, always relish them, especially in, in Atlanta, singing Parama Karuna, having ecstatic uh, emotional breakdowns at that time. Also in Mayapur in 1975, when he was talking about there being 10 million gurus in ISKCON and he entered an ecstatic trance. So those brahmacharya years were wonderful experiences for me. Uh, and of course, like all of my God brothers and God sisters, we suffered tremendous anxiety about Prabhupada's health in 1977. That was the last time I saw him at the Mayapur festival in 1977. And he was still, um, he was still able to walk and, and participate, but he was clearly getting more frail. So after Srila Prabhupada's departure, there was a great deal of angst amongst the leaders of this con. Uh, again, as I was serving as a brahmachari in those days and a young man, uh, the, my elders, who were maybe five to ten years older than I, had a great deal of weight placed on their shoulders. So again, in 1978, after the, the first Mayapur festival after Srila Prabhupada's departure, the GBC gathered and was debating what to do next. I honestly had the impression I was serving Satsuru Maharaj as, as a, an assistant and secretary at that time. And I can see from the GBC meetings as he was returning, there was a great deal of uncertainty about how to proceed. Uh, the, it was like these young men had this tremendous weight placed on their shoulders and they really didn't know what to do. So there was a debate in the GBC about whether or not to consult one of Prabhupada's God brothers, one of his supportive and close God brothers. Some people were against it and said they, the GBC is responsible, should figure it out themselves. Uh, but others said, no, we need guidance. And so that side prevailed and they did go to consult with this senior uh, Gaudiya Math leader. So in that consultation, they recorded a tape of the whole interview, which I was then uh, uh, tasked to transcribe. Remember, we did not have um, internet, AI or anything. I borrowed Hari Sari Prabhu's typewriter and uh, typed out the, the uh, transcription. So in that interview, the, the GBC were asking advice on how to continue initiations in ISKCON. And this uh, venerated elder uh, devotee expressed his, his opinion, his view, which was very much in line with how he had conducted himself after the breakup of the Gaudiya Mat. Uh, his view was that each person should have, each leader should have their own part of the uh, ISKCON world. He said that Srila Prabhupada built a house in which the whole world could live, but after you're married, you need your own room. So that view prevailed, and that was the genesis of the zonal acharya system, which then became the law of the land for the next six or seven years. So initially, um, I, like most others, just considered that, okay, this is the GBC's decision. We're just going to go along with it. Um, it grew increasingly uncomfortable for me personally, when the uh, GBC guru under whom I was working was clearly not chanting his rounds. Uh, I served as his secretary as well for some time, and he was very sincere, very hardworking, but not taking the time in his day, and I would see him practically all day. He was not taking any time out to chant. So a god brother and I confronted him uh, about this, and he said, you have no idea how much I'm chanting in my mind. So that kind of left us feeling like uh, 
left me feeling like working with this person was not a, a good choice. Um, and so I left that zone and the, the service that I was doing there was, was very, uh, very dear to me. Uh, and again, I, I have great respect for this man even now. He was very sincere. I think more sincere in, in, in the fact than uh, many of his peers in terms of not wanting to take an exalted position as a guru in ISKCON. Uh, at that time, the standard was that every guru should have a Yasasan in the temple room. And so in, in Los Angeles, where I was serving, they would bring the Yasasans in according to who was visiting, sometimes one, sometimes four. And it became quite a, a furniture moving operation. Uh, so so the, the devotee under whom I was working, who's Rameshwar Prabhu, was uh, very much against that. And he didn't want it. He didn't want to do that. And several other GBC gurus came and sort of coerced him. Well, we all have to do the same thing. And so I saw him kind of pushed. And I may have been against his nature. And that may have led to some of the uh, spiritual lack of spiritual practices that ultimately came out. So this during this period, I'll just mention, I was doing a service that I really loved, which was uh, the Bhakti program in Los Angeles. Tanavir then Brahmachari uh, took me in, trained me up, and we were conducting an ashram that was still continuing to attract devotees regularly. This was the experience I had in, in the early days of, of my involvement at ISKCON. What, whatever temple we were serving at and I, or, I, or I would visit, young people were just joining. It was something you could count on. And there was no con uh, congregation in those days. So when devotees joined, they would help with the Harinam, help with the book distribution. The temples did not have a lot of money, but they were very happy. And uh, there was a sense that as long as we chant and distribute books, people will join. So that was going on strongly in Los Angeles. Uh, during the time I ran it, we had about 25 devotees who had joined. And uh, it was, it was uh, carrying on very well um, in that time after Prabhupada's departure. Looking back, I can see a sort of kinetic energy was there, that the devotees had faith and the newcomers had faith consequently. <coughs> and uh, things looked like they were going to go forward. But as I had the experience of beginning to doubt the um, high spiritual position of my authority. So, so did many others. Uh, and then the first of these 11 fell. Uh, that was Jayatirtha Prabhu. I knew Jayatirtha. He was a very nice man, very nice man and uh, very sincere and very intelligent devotee. So his previous habits uh, of taking LSD apparently revived in him. And again, it's hard to say how much the pressure of having to be a pure devotee, having to be an Uttam Adhikari led him to that kind of uh, di uh, diversion, but it did. And uh, at first he tried to present it as kind of a higher ecstasy. And it was just uh, an example of a guru entering prema, but then it became clear that that was not the case. But when that happened, the, young and inexperienced and uh, GBC made a very foolish decision and coerced him into taking sannyas. Uh, again, they were trying to circle the wagons because if one of them was exposed as not being on this level of Srila Prabhupada, then that was going to look bad for them all. So they forced him to take sannyas, turn over this new leaf. Uh, and it was awful because it was not at all his nature. It was extremely cruel to his wife and son. And, um, but that's what happened. And so for, again, for a little while that worked, but then uh, with the GBC meeting, it was perhaps 1980 or 81, uh, he said, no, I'm not gonna take the authority of ISKCON anymore. I'm going to go over to uh, a Gaudiya Math guru. And he did with a lot of his followers. So that was seen at first as a big aberration, and, but it did send shockwaves through the, the movement in terms of were these gurus really infallible? Um, this uh, notion also of needing to take sannyas, that also kind of pressed another leader into doing this. Uh, it was Bhagavan Prabhu, again, very 
sincere, very intelligent leader, very good man. Uh, but when he took sannyas, then it, it came out that really was not his natural position. And again, tragic for his uh, very devoted wife and, and children. Uh, Sitala tells us a lot about this in her her uh, video documentary, 50 Years in ISKCON, which, um, because she was much more involved with that whole uh, situation. I did not know him very well. But the, uh, the, the devotees that I did know who started having these problems uh, definitely tested my faith in ISKCON. Now, because the momentum from Prabhupada's presence began to fade after three or four years, people stopped joining the ashram. It became much more uh, difficult to maintain the temples. A few devotees who were there, who were collecting money and selling books, were really under a lot of pressure to help the temple meet the bills. Uh, so as a result, because the books were not very profitable, temples began uh, going into other paraphernalia to sell. And these very sincere de devotees, preachers who were selling books were then asked to sell things like Korean oil paintings, which were cheap knockoffs that could be bought at a low price and then but would appear to be nice art and sell for a good profit. So that, uh, that became, in the particular area where I was serving, that became the standard way of supporting the temples. And some de devotees became very skilled at it. Devotees who were managing became very proficient uh, business managers. Enough money was coming in to at, at least maintain the temples that had been built around the initial enthusiasm of Prabhupada's presence through books and even farm projects. Um, so at that time, I was a temple president. I became a temple president in 1982 and um, 81. Yes. And so I was responsible for raising the money and the, the program I was handed was the painting sales. I never liked the painting sales for several reasons. First, it, it was not inspiring for the devotees. And secondly, it was a terrible business product in that it did not engender any repeat customers. Every day you had to find somebody new to buy one of these paintings. Uh, other devotees, incidentally, were selling candles or even... Uh, excess surplus records uh, from various, you know, various record companies that were dumping them cheap. So anyway, all this was going on. And I felt at least as a business, this is a horrible option, not sustainable and terrible for the devotees spiritually. So another temple president friend and I decided to get into a different business, which was marketing vegetarian foods through multi-level marketing. And this at least would have the, the benefit of uh, being related to our philosophy and also providing residual customers who could then, uh, we could grow a business instead of depending on the hand to mouth approach of the paintings. So as the temple president, I started that business and um, began to get a little success, uh, but the zonal GBC and other leaders didn't like it. They felt it was a threat to the sanctity of the painting sales. <laughs> and so so uh, after a short time, they asked me to just move out of the temple. So I had married at that point in, in, because doing that business obviously was much more of a grihasta type of vocation, but I was doing it entirely for the benefit of the temple. And when they asked me to move out, I encountered a conundrum that I believe many of my God brothers and God sisters experienced. Uh, we, we gave... Our, our educational years, our earning years, we, we surrendered everything to ISKCON. And at the point of then needing to be financially independent, we were kind of uh, left on our own. So the temple just didn't have any resources to do otherwise. It wasn't like they were holding back. But at the same time, many devotees became discouraged uh, with, with their involvement in ISKCON and really gave up their if not their personal spiritual practice, but at least their allegiance to the movement. This was, again, against the backdrop of zonal acharyas who were beginning to fall one after the next. So I, I uh, was kind of forced out of the temple on my own, no money, no experience. Somehow managed to, to uh, make it with this business. Um, and it started going pretty well. And um, 
Uh, at that point, though, my, my wife at the time decided she really didn't like being married to somebody who had been kicked out of the temple. So she went back to the temple and left me. So I was doing my business alone. It was a tough period. Yeah, but I had a couple of friends, uh, Krishna Gopal Prabhu particularly, he gave me a tremendous amount of support. I'm very indebted to him. Garuda Prabhu also uh, got me through that difficult period. And then some other friends seeing my position, even the ones who had helped get me out, they also helped find me another wife. And we married and have had a, a wonderful marriage for the last 42 years. So it was all to test by Krishna. But at that point, I think I shared with many of my God brothers and sisters a sense of alienation to the movement. I didn't uh, really participate in many temple activities for about a year, although I always chanted my rounds and kept the principles and so forth. So uh, after pursuing this business for a year, uh, I was invited to go to Houston and be a temple president there in 1982, 83. Uh, and I decided that I really had enough of the business. Plus, I had faith in Tamal Krishna Maharaj, one of the zonal acharyas who had uh, spoken out that Prabhupada had never appointed me as a guru. He gave some talks at the Pyramid House in uh, Topanga Canyon, where Nishingananda Prabhu invited him and taped him, explaining, yes, we were never appointed as gurus by Srila Prabhupada. We were appointed to give initiations on his behalf because he was too ill to do it himself. He never indicated that we were the only ones. He never indicated that the system of Rithikism that we were performing was going to continue. So because Tamal Krishna Mars was very clear on these points, I felt inspired to work with him, which I did. And at that time, a lot of his god brothers were abandoning him for similar reasons to what I had experienced elsewhere. Um, part of the zonal acharya system was that god brothers had to be disciples of their guru, of the zonal guru, practically. But uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj was past that and was, uh, treated his god brothers with respect and as peers, so um, for the most part. So I worked with him for a couple of years, then went up to uh, Vancouver so our son could be in school, Gurukula, there. Uh, but being a temple president was difficult in those days. Houston, as in Vancouver, were dependent on painting sales, largely. And again, I didn't, I detested that business, but uh, that was what it took. And we, we did not have much of a congregation. Now, to his credit, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, who was depending on the painting sales, also recognized the potential of engaging the Indian community as congregational members for our temples. So when we purchased a new temple in ISKCON, Houston, we uh, opted instead of a, a place that might be closer to a college or to uh, a lot of Western outreach, uh, we, we opted under Tamal Krishna Maharaj's guidance to get the current property, which was an old Baptist church. So that obviously has done tremendously well. It flourished and grew and the congregation grew wonderfully. And uh, at that point I was, um, as I mentioned, going elsewhere because of family needs. Now, a little, uh, something stuck in my memory over the years at that time. I, you know, I was working as an ISKCON religious professional, earning just barely enough to sustain myself and, and, uh, and the family. I mean, not even a thousand dollars a month. And, uh, and I was told by one of the new congregational members that, well, if if you really want to understand Krishna consciousness, if you really want to be Krishna conscious, you have to have a job and then you volunteer your services. So that was the first inkling in my mind that the congregation did not have the same background and experience as those of us who had been through the ashrams. And uh, no, that was kind of an eye opener for me. But in any case, we kept going on and developing and doing our best under the circumstances to continue and to maintain and grow the movement. In Vancouver, it was kind of a similar situation in that the temple was dependent upon the painting sales. But in that case, the devotees who were selling the paintings had kind of given up on supporting the temple and gone off into their own business. So the temple was just barely getting by uh, and really could not afford to provide anything for me. So I, I got a job and worked outside while also being the temple president. Uh, that 
was not very fulfilling for me because I really lo loved to preach and I wanted to develop the preaching. So after two or three years of that, I got an invitation from the devotees in Washington to go there. Upanuga Prabhu was the temple president and he was re resigning. So uh, in order to get back into a preaching situation, I took that, that uh, opportunity. So I, this was around the time when the, several of the zonal acharyas were falling down. Uh, the most vivid one was uh, Bhavananda Prabhu and uh, at a meeting in New Vrindavan. It was, again, circling the wagons. The remaining zonal acharyas kind of uh, tried to sell to the gathered uh, leaders that we should keep Bhavananda instated, even though he had some difficulty. Um, that did not sit well with the leaders and more and more devotees were losing faith and leaving. And uh, staying on as a temple president, it was in a way kind of an anomaly. Uh, so I always felt like it would be my responsibility to try to help ISKCON because that was my obligation to Srila Prabhupada. As ISKCON, the institution had provided the means for me to get connected with Prabhupada, so I wanted that facility to continue. Uh, however, Washington was, was very difficult for that. It uh, was shifting into a congregational mode. And again, the, uh, the gulf of understanding between those who had the background of, of the ashram and the full surrender and those who were coming from the congregational side was, it was difficult to breach. So as a result of that, I ended up going to take another temple presidency in Miami. There, the devotees were uh, more tuned into book distribution and preaching as a means of supporting the temple. The congregation was embryonic, uh, and they were just selling a property on the beach to buy a, a new property in Coconut Grove, which was more of a preaching-friendly uh, area. So I took that service for uh, two, two or three years. Um, that was very fulfilling. The city was great for preaching. We were developing things. The problem was their security for my family. And I could not keep them safe. We were broken into twice, once, uh, both times while I was at Mangalarti. And my wife was at a home with our infant children. Um, the second time she was cornered behind a door, threatened with a gun, and just managed to dial 911 in time to persuade the intruder to go away. So at that point, we realized we couldn't really keep our family in, in that environment. And our kids were getting of an age where they were um, older ones were needing to be in school again. So at that point, we moved to Alachua. We say, all roads end in Alachua. And my wife made me promise I would not be the temple president there, and I agreed. But I found other employment in the ISKCON world by uh, serving as a... Uh, administrator and consultant for ISKCON Foundation. At this point, the devotees had recognized that the old means of financially supporting the temples was not going to be viable any longer. And so we switched to the idea of developing congregations as a means of maintaining the temples. So, and the, the, the devotees in the congregation were very grateful for ISKCON because in many cases, ISKCON was their only option for religious activity in the cities in which they lived. And they became very staunch devotees, enthusiastic devotees. They began to better understand the devotees who had come from different backgrounds, from the ashram backgrounds. Uh, the, so the, the temples uh, began to grow and my service was specifically to help the temples uh, develop the software and the, the standard professional uh, systems of uh, donor development. So I studied uh, for some time, studied the Catholic Church, took some professional training, and then went out to visit all the temples in North America to share this technology and, and practice. So I did that for some years and uh, was able to, again, earning $1,000 a month just able to maintain my family at the bare minimum, but happy to be working for ISKCON, enthused about developing it for the future. Um, at that time, personally, I, I'll just mention that I was able to buy my first house. Um, I had no money, but a friend said, if, you, if I could live in the garage, I'll give you the down payment, buy it on your credit. I had good credit, so we bought the house. And the house appreciated. 
And I thought this is a nice way to make money. So when I sold that house, I made some chunk of money, put it into another house. And so we would, my family would live in the house for some years as it appreciated. Fortunately in Florida, it was a very good time for that. And uh, we would be professional movers as my wife liked to say. We'd move, we'd live, we'd sell, we'd buy another one. And uh, it was lucrative enough that over time we got to uh, be able to keep the properties that we were uh, moving away from and use them as rentals and so forth. So buying and selling about 20 properties over our 30 year career in the Alachua uh, County area allowed us to have financial independence and not be reliant on ISKCON for supporting us fully. So Krishna was, I felt reciprocating with my desire to be involved in helping sustain the movement and preach by giving me this uh, means of earning an income that did not require any professional qualifications or background. So uh, working for the ISKCON Foundation for some years as a consultant was um, inspiring and we were hopeful. Uh, over time, that, that initiative kind of ran its course. I took some other related services with ISKCON in dispute resolution and in teaching. And uh, uh, by this time, uh, I, I should mention that the Zonal Acharya system had petered out and I was involved with that. So I want to share a little bit about what was involved. When the Zonal Acharyas began to fall down after Bhavananda, uh, Bhagavan, Rameshwara, uh, very sincere devotees, all of them. I, I really don't have any animus towards any of them. Uh, they, they, they were certainly sincere in their day and did a ton of service for Prabhupada and whatever difficulty they had. Uh, you know, that's not for me to judge. But the, the concept of devotees having to be in this exalted position was a terrible philosophical mistake. And again, these were, again, very young men with this huge burden on their shoulders. They weren't, in my experience, ambitious or uh, trying to lord it over. They just misunderstood the role of guru. They thought they had to be as the same as Prabhupada, and that was what it meant to be a guru. And that was all they knew. Vyasasans, big Vyas pujas. And they couldn't handle it, and uh, it came to an end. So the process of that coming to an end was something I was involved with. Um, I believe it was 1985, 84, 85. The uh, GBC called a 50-man committee together to review the performance of each of the gurus and each of the GBC members. This was a result of a grass, grassroots campaign, mostly by the temple presidents in North America. Uh, as one of them called it, we were, we were going to be the loyal opposition. We we're loyal to ISKCON, but we were opposed to the system that the GBC was using. The Zonal Acharya system created this two-tier administration where there was the GBC, but then there were the gurus. And the gurus had their own kind of, um, uh, you know, tattva. And the GBC were kind of on the side. So the result of the 50-man committee meeting, which was held here in Mayapur. No women, 50 men. Uh, we, we interviewed all of the GBCs and gurus individually and uh, went over things with them and um, concerns that we had. And as a result of that whole exercise, the GBC was able to reassert itself as the authority over the gurus. Uh, and then steps were taken to begin to diminish the standards of, of guru worship in ISKCON that were prevailing during the Zonal Acharya days. So bit by bit, this began to uh, recalibrate how the guru disciple practices were done in ISKCON. Uh, at one point, it became uh, permissible for any GBC member to anoint any devotee in their zone as a Diksha Guru. All they needed to do was give their permission and that person could begin initiating. So the first reaction was to have a lot of people start to initiate, but then some of them did not do well either. So then the GBC began pulling in the reins and making a, a more structured system uh, that has somewhat minimized the guru fall downs, but has also tremendously slowed down the preaching uh, because most people in my generation are simply not willing to take that service. So I'd like to speak about that for a moment. This is one of the lasting impacts of the Zonal Acharya system. Um, because it was such a 
division between those who were initiating and those who were not. Uh, it, it became kind of ingrained in Prabhupada's disciples that, well, that was for somebody else. And then when they had trouble, they, uh, the, the natural reaction was, well, I would never want to mess with that. So this is very sad because Srila Prabhupada's vision, as, a, as I understand it, was quite different. He had in, uh, expected his disciples to become regular gurus, a phrase he used several times towards the end of his manifest pastimes. Regular gurus means just... You start initiating disciples. You're you, you are following the principles. You preach. People get inspired by your preaching. You initiate them. It's a natural progression. So um, in 1975, in April, Srila Prabhupada was speaking in Mayapur, as I mentioned earlier, but I want to revisit that, that event. Uh, it was the second Mayapur festival, organized Mayapur festival. Uh, Mayapur is very mostly rice fields. The only building was the Lotus Building and the Boundary Wall. Those were the only structures. So uh, uh, one morning in class, Srila Prabhupada was speaking on the newly published Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. And each morning he would speak on one verse. So we're going a verse a day. Uh, on the 13th day, it was verse number 13, uh, which is about Advaita Acharya. So Srila Prabhupada began speaking about Advaita Acharya. And then he began focusing on the meaning of acharya. He said acharya means one who knows the philosophy, practices the philosophy, and teaches the philosophy. After then he said it is not difficult. It's not difficult. All you have to do is follow your acharya. And then he looked out at us, about 150 of us, with mismatched socks and dysentery. And he said, so how many acharyas do we have in our movement? 10,000, 10,000 will become 100,000. 100,000 will become a million. A million will become 10 million. And there will be no scarcity of acharyas. And he spoke very strongly. You organize like this, organize like this. He said that at the end of his talk, he said, you are young men, you can do this. I am old, I have no opportunity. And with those words, he went into a trance it just where he just withdrew from outer circumstances. And we were all sitting there just stunned watching him in his, with, in his ecstatic state. We really didn't know what to do. We just watched for about two minutes, as I recall. Then Hansaduta picked up a Madanga and started a Kirtan. And Prabhupada kind of withdrew from his trance and then stepped down from the asana. The class was over. You can hear this on the... Uh, in the archives of Prabhupada's lectures. It was April 6th, 1975. So in that lecture, to me, Prabhupada was, in, he was envisioning his disciples becoming gurus. All of them. He wanted all of them. And he also made this statement on many other occasions. Vyas Puja in London in 1973, I believe. He said, all of you, uh, men and women, you all become gurus. So he was very strong about this. But because of the zonal acharya catastrophe, only about 2% of Srila Prabhupada's disciples are initiating disciples. It's still lingering, this idea that initiating disciples is for the privileged few, the very special few. What Prabhupada said, though, was actually quite different. That it, it was for anybody who, was, uh, who knew the philosophy, practiced the philosophy, and was teaching the philosophy. Uh, the idea of worship of the guru, again, poisoned the perception of many of my generation and um, made them feel like I would never get involved with that, ever. I would never get involved with, with doing that. I, I couldn't imagine people worshiping me as God. And look what happened to these, these devotees who put themselves in this exalted position and had so much trouble and created so much chaos. Uh, this is a great catastrophe for our movement. We're still struggling with it. Uh, Srila Prabhupada envisioned 10 million gurus after almost 50 years from that lecture, we have just around 100. <laughs> and uh, most of my generation is aging out. And those who are sincere preachers who know the philosophy well, but are in women's bodies, they're just not allowed, <laughs> which has again been a great catastrophe for our preaching in the West. Uh, because women, because people look at ISKCON, do I want to get involved with this movement? Well, let me see. Oh, they don't 
allow women to take leadership posts, forget it. Both men and women look at us as very backwards because of this. So there is a GBC resolution that women can initiate. It's been held in abeyance because of protests from India. Uh, the uh, uh, compromise presented by Radha Swami and others was to have a, a cultural sensitivity policy that different parts of the world could apply various policies according to their needs. And this was to apply to women giving initiation in ISKCON. Uh, that was the law until it was put in abeyance because of political pressure. And so there is where we stand right now. We're hoping that that will be over because there are uh, a number of very qualified disciples of Srila Prabhupada in female bodies who have aspiring disciples. So um, we're still in these ways suffering the hangover of the zonal acharya days. There was one, one every year subsequent to the GBC's Reascendancy in ISKCON in the late 80s, early 90s, there were steps taken to minimize and reduce the worship standards for Diksha Gurus. But because a few Diksha Gurus have thousands or tens of thousands of disciples, it's still seen as something that is not for the rank and file. And it's my fervent hope that when my generation is out of the way, the next generation can have a more realistic understanding of what it means to take disciples. Uh, the scripture says, of course, that Siksha and Diksha disciples are on this, I mean, uh, gurus are on the same level, uh, but not in Iska. The Diksha is here and the Siksha is here. Everybody will be a Siksha, but nobody wants to be a Diksha. There are very few. And if they are, people say, oh, look what an arrogant person this is. This is really sad because it's best, it's natural, Prabhupada writes, that if a person becomes a Siksha guru for the newcomer, they naturally become the Diksha guru. If the person is following the principles and if they are um, knowing the philosophy well, as can be demonstrated by tests as Prabhupada directed, then they have the right naturally to initiate those to whom they are preaching. That's so much better and healthier than uh, just a few people coming in, giving initiation, and then being pretty much out of touch with the disciples a lot of the time. And that's a hangover from the zonal acharya um, fiasco. So the, the standards of worship for the, the gurus in Eskand was gradually reduced. We're still working on that, but it, it came down to something that's a little more uh, manageable now, like um, uh, gurus are required to have one, only one Vyas Puja per year, not multiple ones in different days, in different places. Um, Pranam mantras are to be kept for the disciples if it, it made at all special pranams other than the standard one. Um, Guru Dakshina is being scrutinized very carefully now because the, the funds tend to flow from disciples to gurus and not to ISKCON, even though ISKCON gave birth to the disciples. So these kind of issues are still with us, still being worked on by the GBC. But the, the good part is that the GBC is now at least recognized as being above the gurus um, the challenge now is really the tension between East and West. The, the needs for guru and the, the practices of guru disciple uh, procedures in India is, is very different than in, in the West, at least the part of the West where I preach in North America. The numbers of, dis, of devotees joining are much greater in India. The problems of Dakshina are much greater in India. Uh, the uh, minimization of other leaders is perhaps greater in India because of the natural culture of, of irreverence to the guru. So these are issues that cause the leaders in India to feel that, yes, there needs to be some adjustments, uh, radical adjustments in the way that guru-disciple relationships work in this part of the world. Uh, the appeal of this kind also in, the, in India particularly is that it has conservative values and holds on to conservative practices. This is particularly uh, appealing to cultured families and cultured people in India. The, uh, uh, the, the traditional side, however, is very unappealing to people in America. Now, this is a phenomenon I like to discuss from my own perception 
in my 52 years in ISKCON. In the early days, in, 19, in the 60s, and even when I joined in the early 70s, the temples were very um, informal. They were more relaxed, especially like we take 26 Second Avenue, Prabhupada would invite people to come in without any changes in their life, just adding Krishna. You remember he initiated his first batch of disciples. It was after that they asked about the regulative principles. <laughs> And that was when Prabhupada established them for all subsequent initiations. But just think about that for a moment. He initiated people who were just chanting, hadn't changed their clothes, hadn't changed their habits drastically, and were just beginning to blossom as devotees. And so after that, he began to raise the standards. But the general mood of coming in to the temple and just adding Krishna and not having to change your life radically, that still prevailed. And that was very appealing. Like when I joined in 1972, I didn't feel the tremendous pressure to uh, change my life, although I was quite willing to do it. That was the hippie days when there was a great rejection of the mainstream. Anyway, after that time, around that time, and shortly after Srila Prabhupada began bringing his disciples to India, and then a few years after that, the devotees from India started coming back to the West. And they, in their experiences of Indian culture, had imbibed a lot of practices that were uh, above and beyond the basics of chanting 16 rounds and following the principles. So more and more of that uh, cultural creep began to take place. And to be a devotee in ISKCON by the late 70s meant you, uh, you had to be a brahmachari. And, and, uh, if you were a woman, you were going to be relegated to a second class position. Uh, that became what was a warm, friendly, family like atmosphere in the temples became this rather formal and segregated one. And uh, that was much less appealing to people in the West. So that was one of the contributing factors, in addition to the chaos with the leadership and gurus, to people stopping. Uh, re re refraining from joining the ashrams as regularly as they used to. So we had this cultural burden. We had this uh, <clears throat> leadership chaos and pretty much the temples would have died were it not for the congregations. And the congregations developed and they appreciated Prabhupada, appreciated the teachings. And uh, as a result, they became initiated devotees. They took responsibilities. They helped financially. They built beautiful new temples. So the congregational phase of our movement has been very successful in that respect. But what has been lost in it is the original flavor of uh, the ashrams that attracted so many people in the early days. So as I said, I was involved personally with working on congregational development through the 90s uh, into the early 2000s. But at that point, uh, I went into other things, other services. So in 2006, my wife and I were invited to run the temple in Gainesville, Florida. We had lived in Alachua for 15 years as congregational members, uh, just participating in temple events, but not doing much outreach. Uh, I thought at that point, that part of my life that I loved so much was more or less over. At best, I could be indirectly helping the movement grow. So I was doing that. But uh, it, it, with that opportunity, I thought, okay, great. Here's Krishna's given me a chance to get back into direct preaching. Uh, I still had fond memories of the ashram in my own life and in the uh, years that I spent training others in Los Angeles. And I had tried to implement that sort of practice in all of the temples I managed unsuccessfully. So finally, this temple seemed a little more open to it because it was just a small operation doing a lunch program on campus at the University of Florida for two or 300 people. And the temple owned some properties that were rented out to college students. So that was the situation I inherited. There were two devotees in the temple at that time who were participating in the morning program. And uh, we uh, doubled it, my wife and I, by participating. So we went from two to four. <laughs> and one morning we were doing Tulsi RT and I was dancing around Tulsi. And I thought, how can these 50,000 college students three blocks away ever relate to this sight of middle-aged people dancing around a plant at five in the morning? Where is this ever going to connect? <laughs> so uh, 
under the, the inspiration of several senior devotees. I want to name them. First was Mother Jamuna or Jamuna Prabhu. She did not like to be called Mother. I called her Mother Jamuna once, and she said, "Yes, Father Kalakanta." Uh, that was another example of the friendly, uh, equitable mood in the early days. Everybody was Prabhu. Prabhupada called his female disciples Prabhu. Uh, and they, everyone called each other Prabhu because it was, what was important was not the Sanskrit grammar, but the mood of service. And that's, uh, that was, that's one of the things we imbibe from Jamuna. In addition to the informality and to the friendliness and to the warmth that she uh, presented in her ashram in Sharanagati, uh, where we would visit her in the summers. Another inspiration for me was Prithu Prabhu. Prithu Prabhu is a powerful preacher and he by going to music festivals and, and other favorable places showed that with strong preaching, people still could be convinced to be devotees. But I saw in Prithu Prabhu's success in bringing very nice devotees in was that he did not have a program for maintaining them, for sustaining them. And that was a problem. Uh, Jamuna's problem was just basically being a woman and having to separate herself from this con in order to do preaching. My third inspiration was Sri Dhananda Maharaj. Of course, he advocated Krishna West uh, as a means to attract Westerners. And uh, that also inspired me this sense of people not needing to change their lives drastically to become devotees, as Prabhupada had demonstrated at 26 Second Avenue. Um, it wasn't completely sold on the notion of Krishna West entirely abandoning all kinds of cultural practices that Prabhupada had at least enjoyed, if not introduced. So, um, so we took a synthesis of all of that. Vidyananda Maharaj sent a nice devotee, uh, Ali Krishna Prabhu, who uh, uh, helped us establish a first little ashram pilot project in Gainesville. That was in 2008. Much to our surprise, it took off. We went from three new students, and no one had moved in there in 10 years. <laughs> Not a single devotee had been made there in 10 years. And first, suddenly we had three newcomers, then six, and then 12. About another property, we expanded to have 25 beds for new students. And that ashram has pretty much been full ever since. Um, that the magic of the early days that Jamuna helped us capture, uh, that has been the key. And the gender equity, that has been the key. Half the space for men, half the space for women, equal opportunities for both. Uh, that attracts young men and young women and makes them feel very much at home in ISKCON, like they don't have to make this dramatic change in their life to be a monk, to be a, an utter renunciate. They can continue with their college, continue with their jobs and add Krishna consciousness. We're very strict about four regular principles. We're very strict about japa, although the um, minimum is eight rounds to start in living in the ashram. So since that time, we've had over 350 devotees who have moved in, who actually joined ISKCON with us or come to our center for training. And it is the, the vibrant, uh, youthful community of young men and young women together, practicing Krishna consciousness, learning to do the RT, learning to do the songs, learning to lead kirtans, learning to teach. That has created this re renaissance of the early days of ISKCON in Gainesville. For me, it has been the best part of my life to see that the ashram experience that meant so much to me is not lost. So now our task is to help share this with congregations. And uh, we are taking the, what has worked in Gainesville out to other temples to see. Many are interested, but uh, we've had mixed success so far in the two years of doing this, uh, trying to recreate the early days. Some temples don't really want to make the change. They don't want to make the investment. Uh, they want to micromanage and, and, and not allow the freedom that is necessary to create an environment. So those temples very sincerely tried. It didn't work out. We appreciate it. Other temples are working and, and achieving success. And uh, our hope is that we can establish an ashram presence in many parts of the country so that young men and women can uh, follow up on their initial interest in Krishna consciousness in a, in a supportive, encouraging, and blissful environment. So that in a, an hour is a nutshell of my odyssey in ISKCON. As I said, ISKCON saved my life. And I'm so grateful to Srila Prabhupada for his sacrifice in coming here and to establish this movement and all of the headaches that were involved with that. I've shared in a small way those headaches, trying to run temples. 
I share them still. My hope is that the devotees who are preaching in areas where the con constituency is primarily or even totally from a Hindu background will recognize how difficult it is to bring people from non-Hindu backgrounds into Krishna consciousness. Uh, in, in the early days, I'll end with this point, um, when all the temples in America were, were growing and new, newcomers were coming, uh, men and money came to India from America. Uh, and for those who came to India, India was sort of Timbuktu. It was in a place where you were going to be in very austere conditions, very difficult conditions, very different from the blissful, expansive, beautiful practicing temples that were going on in North America. So over the years, through all of this chaos with zonal charas, et cetera, et cetera, the, the uh, situation has flipped. And the temples in India are incredibly uh, progressive and prosperous and well-organized and making huge impact on society. Whereas the temples in America are now primarily catering to about 1% uh, of the population. And uh, that is something that without a doubt, Srila Prabhupada would not accept. We have in his pranam mantra, Paschatya de Shatarane. He, he wrote describing his own unique contribution delivering the Western countries. Believe it or not, it has been proposed that that mantra be changed from Paschatya to Sarvaloka Deshatarani, to the saving the whole world. Uh, and uh, fortunately, that has not gained much traction. But the point is that for people like me who have spent our whole lives preaching in the West, it is a whole different world. And although our Indian brothers are doing great and they're prospering and they have money and resources, what we need in the West is not help. We just need our freedom to preach as we need to preach. And people in the West expect gender equity. Prabhupada always made very clear that women could take leadership roles, spiritual leadership roles, initiating disciples. Some, but not many. That's all we need. None is not some. <laughs> Sometimes people say, well, if somebody rises to the level of Janavi Devi, then they can initiate. Well, why don't we apply that standard to men then? Right? This, this double standard is very conspicuous. It really cripples us in the West. I've been an apologist for the GVC, an apologist for ISKCON for years and years and years, patiently waiting, encouraging others. No, no, don't give up faith in ISKCON yet. We're going to get this straightened out. I hope that those who are hearing this will understand how important it is to allow for cultural differences, to be applied when spreading Krishna consciousness. And the Chaitanya Charitamrita Prabhupada writes very strongly. We all know he hated the word impossible and said it was a word in a fool's dictionary. Guess what he called the idea of imposing cultural values from one society on another? Impossible. He said it's impossible, it's a cause of fall down the Imagraha. You cannot spread Krishna consciousness unless you make some adjustments. And what was the specific adjustment Prabhupada was noted for? Allowing women to, to take leadership roles in, in the West. Now, sometimes people complain that Prabhupada said women were not, or they say that women were not temple presidents. Yes, they were in their childbearing and child rearing years in those days. All of the women were in those years. But now it's completely different. And you have women with 30, 40, 50 years of experience preaching who have aspiring disciples. And then you have the message from the leadership. Well, we don't know if that's uh, allowable. Just try to understand how difficult that makes it for us. We are trying to convince people to chant Hare Krishna. Then we're trying to convince them to follow the regulator principles. We, we kind of reduce the cultural barriers so people can be themselves and add Krishna. And that's working. But then you got to say, and well, you have to be patient with the leadership of this movement for not allowing women e equity in our association. That's a hard pill for people to swallow. So even if they take up Krishna consciousness, they have no interest in being involved in ISKCON. They have no faith in the GBC. This is the result of this policy of repressing women in leadership roles. So we ask you, please, if you're hearing this, you understand, just allow for cultural sensitivity. That's what it's going to take to keep the East and West together under Prabhupada's lotus feet. What a great offering that will be for him if we can continue to work together in a cooperative way to deliver the whole world to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's lotus feet. 
Hare Krishna.